Okay, I think that's enough people. Um, hello there. I'd like to welcome to you to our event. Thank you for joining us here at our As I, As I Am webinar. I'm Ian Lynham. I'm the Digital Marketing and Information Officer for As I Am. So uh, I'm hand responsible for handling the web content that we put out on a week by week basis. Um, this is one of a number of events for us um, uh, as part of our Say Yes to Autism Acceptance campaign in which we, we aim to go beyond awareness and make sure people in our community have the knowledge and skills they need to meaningfully understand and accept autistic people. I want to remind people at the outset that we've included resources um, on saying yes to autism acceptance at Super Values Nationwide, and additionally, they're available on our website, as I am, .ie. We'd also remind you that there are three further events um, as part of our Say Yes to Autism Acceptance campaign um, which will be taking place next week. So um, we've tried to represent to the best of our ability the diversity of the autism community and, and autistic people in that community. Um, some people might be hyposensitive, some people might be hypersensitive. Um, there are certain traits one autistic person has that another might, as Steve, Dr. Stephen Shore famously said, once you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. However, the key diagnostic criteria as outlined in the DSM-5, such as they are, include um, restricted and repetitive um, patterns of behavior, inter interests or activities. Um, and this includes stimming. So what is stimming? Stimming is short for self-stimulatory behavior. It's a repetitive series of actions, which an autistic person may do when they're anxious, excited or stimulated. And this is one of the key um, traits that unites many people in the autistic community. Um, to quote uh, Jodie O'Neill from her play, What I Don't Know About Autism, uh, all people stim, but autistic people do it with style. So some of them might, us might whistle and rock, whether we're autistic or not, but autistic people such as myself may to choose to do so with objects such as stim toys, fidget spinners, and sensory objects. Um, now, you don't obviously have to go out and buy a fidget spinner. That's the, not the only form. There are many uh, objects that will do the job just as well. And to illustrate how to do it in your own home, I'm joined by Hedin Rutledge and Jill McCanny from Middletown. They are both um, occupational therapists, and I'm delighted to welcome them to the webinar. Thank you, Ian. My name is Aideen, um, and I'm one of the occupational therapists in Middletown, as Ian has said. Um, I'm going to start off with the first four items on um, the agenda that you received. And I'll start off with the first one, which is the gel pad. Um, so the idea of this would be that um, it would be accessible to your child or young person um, on their desk. And it's basically an option uh, or an opportunity to fidget while they work. So what you need is a sandwich bag and some cheap gel. So I went, I went for hair gel and you literally just squeeze it in. Use the whole lot. This might not even be enough. You might be better actually with two tubes of hair gel. Um, because I've got quite a big sandwich bag here. So again, a smaller sandwich bag just might be more practical actually on, on top of the desk. It's not gonna take up as much space. And it's not gonna take up as much gel either. With all of the items that we're going to make during this make and take session tonight, um, it's really nice if you can get your child or young person to be involved in the process. Of creating them because often we find when they are involved there's more buy-in then and they're more likely to um want to use them and be more motivated to use them and also um include their preferences with uh, what's included in the makeup so you could just leave it like this and again as i say a much smaller bag would be better so i think i'm going to actually double that over so you could leave it like this and just have it that it's a gel pad that you squish around or your child or young person might want to add in some items just to add a little bit more texture, leave it a little bit more interesting. Um, so you could include, I've got some items here. 
like marbles and little wooden threading pieces. I'm going to add these into the gel bag as well. This will be a little bit more interesting and for more opportunities to fidget and um, move things around. So the other important thing to do with this would be to tape it to the desk that it's not going to move around or get lost. So again, just mask and tape. Secure it to the desk. And really, ideally, you'd have big, thick black mask and tape that would hold it in place. There's a little bit of air in that, but we should let the air out. It's a Ziploc bag. Now, it is a very nice um, experience and it's a nice tactile um, opportunity there beside you on the desk. And if anybody has it at home and they're making a lot along um, with me, we get to see that. So the, the um, sensation of the gel against the plastic is very nice. And also that particular gel that I used um, is scented as well. So when you open and close the bag, you're going to get um, you're going to get the smell of it. So again, your young person might want to choose the type of um, smell and fragrance. Okay, so there we have the first item. This is a fidget item. And um, the next thing I'm going to make is a pencil fidget. Okay, so again, this can be customized to suit what your young person um, likes, what types of materials they like, types of textures. Um, there are different sizes of pipe cleaners, but I'm going to go for a thin one today because I want to add more items to it. But you can go for a thick piece of pipe cleaner or a thin piece. Um, and you just wrap it around the pencil, like so. Okay, and then you can start to add extra bits to it. Now you could add ribbon, again, whatever your young person, if you, you know, again, I would suggest having a variety of items out and letting them choose what they like best. So you can tie a little bit of ribbon to it. So that's hanging and um, some people really like the feel of the, the silky um, texture to the ribbon. And a, a pencil fidget like this isn't going to be very distracting to others because it's not going to be noisy or um, create any distractions for anyone else in the classroom. So you can spread these out. And then what I would do then is just tie a little knot at the end so that the beads don't fall off. Okay, and then they might like to move it on up the, the pencil and have it loose or whatever way they want. Okay. And again, even just twisting it on and off might be uh, very regulating and reassuring if your young person likes to fidget while they work. So again, the pencil is still fully functional and not distracting to others. So number two on our list is the pencil fidget. The next item on our list is the thinner. So here is one I made earlier. And basically all you need for this is, no one's using CDs anymore, are they? Everyone's on Spotify and we've got all got lots of old CDs lying around. My choice was Beyonce, I'm not using this anymore. So I have made one earlier on and um, I'm going to do another one with you now. I thought using an ordinary marker actually might wipe off. So I've used glass pens but I think like a permanent, I'm not sure if you can get permanent uh, markers in lots of colors, but um, maybe an ordinary marker will work. So again, with, if your young person is able to be involved in this, them designing their own patterns on the CD, whatever colors they want.
and very often um, for both our sensory seekers, Ian spoke there about hyper and hypo. So our sensory seekers are young people, children and young people who seek out additional visual stimuli and um, they may really enjoy this. So, um, but again, it's, it's important that you monitor and make sure that they're not becoming um, overstimulated or spinning using it too much. So just again, careful use of it. And um, also it, it might be helpful for your child who um, enjoys watching spinning items or um, like nice reflective um, items as well as a calming input to help um, lower arousal over all their sensory systems. So just glue, I went again, it, it, maybe if you had a glue gun, but um, high, high quality durable glue from a DIY store is important for this ordinary print stick, whatever would work. And the marble just goes in the center and then with nice sunlight here this evening. So I'm not sure you can see that maybe on the screen. I'm just gonna give it a bit, a bit of a spin. Okay. So that is number three on our list. Close again. I've done zigzaggy lines, straight lines, wavy lines. And the marble actually, I was going to use a little rubber ball, but the marble is really important because it, um, it gives a really good spinning effect on a hard surface. Now, the next item was a little homemade stress ball. So here is one I've made earlier, but I made it upside down. So I'm going to learn by my mistake and do it properly this time. So you need a balloon and you need a permanent marker and you need a funnel and you need corn flour and you need wool. So again, if your child um, is involved in this, they can choose their favorite color of balloon. They can choose their favorite color of wool for the hair. Um, and you need to blow up the balloon and then draw on the facial um, expression. And again, maybe they're going to be involved in that and um, choosing a happy face, a sad face, an angry face, um, or maybe you're going to have a range of different emotions and use them um, whenever your child is experiencing that emotion. So we'll blow it up first. And I need to draw the face upside down because this is the mistake I made earlier. Um, so eyes here. and I'm going to go for an angry face. Okay. Now, I need to add this. This is quite fiddly, so bear with me. We need to add in the corn flour now, so just let the air out of the blue. And I'm going to add my funnel. And it's also messy. So I've spilled corn flour all over um, the carpet here in Middletown. So I'm not going to be that popular, but hopefully I can get this done without too much mess. The corn flour is a lovely texture um, against the balloon. Ordinary flour would also work though. Or you could add um, rice or lentils if you wanted a different texture. And again, maybe involving your young person um, in the process of making and letting them decide is a good idea what works for them. What we find nice, they might find, um, you know, they may prefer a different texture. So I'm just using a pen to get that all in.
Very nice. And you do need it quite full to get the effect. Gel actually could be another thing that you could add to it. I'm just thinking there. Um, and you could have, maybe you'd have a range of all different types of textures and colors and expressions as well. Now, there we are. And Use the string then so I'll just put that out of the way before I spill any more of it and make any more of a mess. Um, we tie the string as hair around the top. And I'm going to add a little bit more air just so that we can see it a little bit better. Now, there we have it, our little homemade stress ball. Okay, and one I made earlier upside down. Okay, everyone, I am going to just very quickly tidy up this because Jill is coming in now to do enough, another four items, um, another four make and take items. So we're going to quickly tidy up and um, Jill will join you then. I might be back at the, at the very end again if we have time show you a few other um, sensory items. Thank you all for watching so far. While um, Aideen uh, prepares up the space for Jill, I'll just uh, remind everyone that if you have any questions, just drop them in the, the chat box and we'll be answering them in due course. Also remind you that the event is being recorded, but will be the recording will cease during the Q&A to preserve, preserve people's privacy. We'd also remind you to, um, to uh, consider either making a donation at asiam.ie or by um, sharing some of our webinars or some of our content on social media using the hashtag Autism Month Say Yes. While um, Aideen is clearing up there, I know that there was um, a little bit of flickering with the screen. Um, we were trying, um, we thought we were being very fancy and trying a GoPro camera for the first time, um, but having some technical issues with it. So um, for the second half, now for the activities I'm going to do, we're going to swap over and um, just to use our computer camera and hopefully um, that will work better. What Aideen is going to do just is hold up um, each item. Um, that she made so that if anybody did miss it with the flickering on the screen, we should just hold up each item again and um, to just give you an idea of what that looks like. Okay, everyone, here is the little fidget, uh, sorry, the spinner. 
from an old CD and a marble with um, little designs drawn on it. Then we have the homemade stress ball with the hair as well um, here. And the gel pad that you can tape to the desk. But as I said, it's really important to maybe go for a smaller bag because that's quite big. You just want it as a fidget item on the desk with lots of nice textures. And then finally, the pencil with the pipe cleaner, the ribbons and the beads. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, I'd also remind viewers that um, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, they will be available on our YouTube channel, as will this be. Okay, everyone, so we'll try it this way. And um, the views may be not quite as good as the table, but I work around it. And um, so we'll we'll see how this camera goes. It's all a good learning experience. And um, so my name is Jill McCanny. Um, like Aiding, I am one of the um, occupational therapists in Middletown. So we're going to start um, with an activity um, using TheraBand, um, but I'm going to show you alternatives to TheraBand. So as Ian mentioned at the start, um, a lot of um, autistic children, young people, adults really like to stim. Um, and for some, the stimming is looking for really kind of deep pressure input, particularly on the joints and on the muscles. And um, so there's one clip, I don't know if any of you have seen clips done by um, a guy called um, The Autistic Genius on his YouTube channel. And he talks about how he kind of locks out his joints because he really likes to get that kind of deep pressure through his muscles and joints. So his kind of stimming is to kind of lock his joints and he likes to crack his knuckles as well, which he demonstrates in his video clip quite loudly. Um, or some of our um, children and young people like to walk up on their toes. There can be various reasons for that. But one of the reasons for some children is because again, getting that kind of stretch through the muscles and getting that kind of lock in the joints that they like. Um, but we need to obviously with toe walking, those kind of stretches, we, we just want to be a little bit careful with them so there are other ways of providing that deep pressure input to the muscles and joints and one um, great way of getting that kind of deep pressure input in is to use resistance materials so some of you may have seen TheraBand uh, so this is TheraBand here it's very simple material as you can see it is a long strip just a resistive material but the only way really to buy TheraBand is in a really big roll which um, can be expensive and um, great if the school or organization is buying it and sharing it um, amongst um, you know, several children and young people, but it's quite expensive if you're just buying it as an individual. So what I'm gonna show you is some alternatives that you may have at home. So what you can get is 
some elastic bandaging. So just available, this cost me 1.49 in the chemist. Now, you're not going to get the same level of resistance as you get with TheraBand. But for some younger children, it may actually be all the resistance that they need. Um, or what you can do is it's always useful to kind of try out with inexpensive things. If it works, and um, if you like it, if your child or a young person likes it, then you know it's worth the investment in a higher grade resistant material like TheraBand. So different ways then of using this material. So we're going to have like a strip um, of the bandaging, um, the scissors to cut off a strip. So if you have any kind of elastic bandaging at home, it's going to work really well. You can get ones that are much more resistive, even than this, the kind of strapping that you might put on an ankle, it's going to give even more stretch and resistance. You can simply use it like this, um, where you, the child, young person, whatever, um, just does stretches with the material. And um, any of you who go to the gym or when you're allowed to go to the gym, um, or maybe in your home workouts, you might use kind of resistive banding so you know about uh, shoulder extensions and bicep curls. So you can do all those kind of activities um, or show a child or young person how to do those, model them for them. And um, we do have, um, and I'll pop it into the chat box, the question and answer box um, at the end, because um, we do have on our website um, a resource showing different activities for using TheraBand. It's on our website, but it's on the social media section, and we have a huge amount of material there, so it's quite hard to find. We are categorizing it in the next couple of weeks, so it'll be much easier to find, but at the minute, it'll take you a little while. Um, so yes, it can be used just as simple activities like that, or it can also, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try finding the best way of using the chair. No, I think if I put a small chair on top of the table, and um, that might be the best way for you to see this. So we're just going to get our strip of bandaging and we are going to tie it around the front legs of the chair like this. So obviously it's going to fit any kind of chair at all, whether um, it's a chair in a classroom, at home at the dining table or doing homework, just a strip tied like that. You could cut off the loose ends, like so. And then I'm not going to get up onto the table to demonstrate this, but um, what um, you can then do, what the child can do, is just when they're sitting on the chair, kick with their feet against that. So then that's giving a bit of resistance to the muscles. So they're getting, we call it a bit like a foot fidget. So um, for children, young people who love, as we say, to kind of stretch their legs, they're maybe um, in the classroom stretching out their legs and sort of bumping into others when they're doing that or on the dinner table, maybe getting sort of kicking siblings and so on accidentally because they're just looking for that stretch. But this provides that kind of fidget where they can kick against that. They could also tuck their legs in behind and kick out that way. That gives a really nice stretch against the muscles. And um, you just need to be careful if feet are tucked behind there, that you know, nobody trips, the feet need to come back around before standing up. So just be careful with that. Um, but yeah, so if that works, what I would suggest is, I mean, that might be enough resistance that might um, you know, resolve the issues. Um, but you might want to try a greater resistance if that works, and then you can look then maybe at getting TheraBand. And um, other than uh, things to try, uh, is a pair of tights as well. So I said I was going to try inexpensive alternatives. So um, any tights at home, um, the kind of um, the higher the dernier, the better. So the kind of really uh, thick tights, and um, maybe um, if you have any. Uh, relatives who have pressure stockings or back when we were doing long haul flights you have the socks they used to get you uh, to wear for those anything like that that's got that really tight stretch that's also uh, going to serve the purpose another way and you can do bandaging or tights for this and another way around the chair is to tie either the tights and um, the better longer length tie the tights or the bandaging this time around the side legs of the chair like this and then this time, this is where we're going back to the thoughts of our bicep curls, our shoulder extensions. When the person is sitting in the chair, they can just do stretches. They can reach down, grab the hold of this and do stretches. So that's a nice activity again for getting that input into the muscles and the joints. 
And for um, a lot of autistic people tell us that they find that very calming, very regulating, and um, just getting that deep pressure right through the muscles and the joints, it has a very regulating effect. And this type of activity where they're either kicking against uh, the bandage in there or whether they're doing stretches with the TheraBand, whatever you're using, um, out to the side here, that is um, minimally disrupted in a kind of either in a family environment, classroom environment, office environment, because you don't have to get up out of your chair. It's giving that input while you're sitting, doing your work, eating your dinner, whatever. And um, so really quite functionally based in that way. Um, the other suggestion that was made to me once was the inner tube of the tire, um, which again would give that kind of um, resistance material and you could just use the inner tube to do then the stretches on that. But as I say, if you find that that is proving very effective, those kind of materials, you think it's going to work, be, uh, be worthwhile purchasing them the TheraBand, then it's worth investing. And TheraBand does come in various resistance grades. So there's light, medium, heavy, and I think there's extra heavy as well. Um, and maybe, you know, if you're part of um, a parent support group um, or you sort of have a, a local group, it might even be worth buying a roll of that. Um, as an organization and then sharing it out and it might be a bit more cost effective that way. Okay, so that is our um, TheraBand stroke bandaging stroke parentites. Um, so now um, what I'm going to move on to now on the itinerary was um, the <laughs> and making handprints for those. So you may um, be familiar, if, certainly if you've been um, to any trainings regarding sensory processing, um, or work with an OT where you're usually big advocates of the wall presses. And um, so a wall press is simply where the person puts their two hands against the wall. They either push all their might against the wall or they might do kind of press ups in and out against the wall. And a little bit like the TheraBand, that's providing resistance through the muscles, deep pressure uh, through the muscles and joints, which again is really uh, regulating input and it provides a bit of movement. And um, so for some, um, autistic young people or adults, the stimming might be to, to uh, seek out a lot of movement, and that just gives that bit of movement alongside the regulating proprioceptive or deep pressure input. So um, you can, of course, just do wall pushes without any kind of uh, visual indicator. But as you can probably just see um, in the background here, I've got some hand prints in the wall, and this provides a visual support of where the child, the young person, whoever, should place their hands in the wall. So it just, um, because depending on their height will depend where they're going to get the best input. And so you can place the men at the height appropriate. And it also just provides a visual prompt of what is expected um, and to do these wall pushes. So it can um, just add that little bit of a support there. So as you can see, really easy to make, but uh, to make it a little bit more fun, we can add a bit of colour, we can add a bit of texture. Uh, so I had said in my list to get coloured cards. So you can, if you've got coloured cards, you know, get it out now and do some hand prints. Or you don't even need coloured card, just a good old cereal box. Um, we really are going into Blue Peter territory now, but any cereal box, just come up. And if you want to make one of these now while I am, please do. Um, I was making them earlier and still have the ink in my hand from earlier. So simply either draw around your own hand and uh, get um, your child or um, whoever to um, place their hand and draw around the hand. So you simply, you can imagine what I'm doing. I know you can't quite see, but I'm just drawing a hand print on a bit of card. And this is kind of for um, younger children. This is a kind of fun activity to do, to draw out their hand. And a little bit of challenge then is to draw around, then use your non-dominant hand. So in that case, that's my left hand. And um, to draw around the other hand, never quite as neat, but um, we're not looking for neatness for this. And then once you've got your two hand prints drawn, you simply um, cut them out. Okay, so. While we're on here, I will cut one out. And um, again, as Aideen said, so for those of you um, who are maybe parents, and um, sit down so you're not being cut off. Uh, for those uh, parents here this evening, if you've got young children, 
Again, getting them involved in this activity is really nice because um, it's going to improve my motor skills, of course, which is OTs. Uh, we're always looking to develop. So scissor skills um, is a great way of developing fine motor skills. Um, and scissor skills are a really good prerequisite for any kind of um, handwriting skills. And um, so it's a fun way of doing that. And actually cutting cardboard like this is another resistive activity because cardboard is just a slightly higher grade than paper and it makes the muscles of the hand work better and then that provides that deep pressure input to the hand this time so mice again calming and regulating if uh, the child or the young person enjoys cutting if they don't like cutting and um, they maybe won't find this activity so calming and you may want to do it for them so I'm not cut out both hands, but um, out of the cardboard, but you can get the idea then. You cut out your hand. And um, this is where you can add some color if you wish. And um, so you may want uh, to color it in, um, or again, if you're a parent and um, here on behalf of your child, you may want to encourage them. They could color in maybe each, each thumb or finger a different color. And um, they might want to do little different patterns on each finger, some little dots there, maybe some wavy lines on another finger. And um, what we do, let's check design on this one. And some nice circles and so on. This one. And then they might want to mix up the colors. So we can, again, just add some stripes, wavy lines to make it nice and colorful. So you get the general idea then of, um, and again, nice coloring activity. Um, and again, coloring can be kind of quite calm and quite regulated for those who enjoy it, not so much for those who don't enjoy any form of pencil skills, but again, nice kind of motivating activity and um, to develop some of those pencil skills anyway. And as Aideen said, involving um, the person who's going to be actually using the resources is a really good idea because it kind of um, will buy in more than to be more interested to try it out. So you can use and say uh, cardboard and color it in. You can use plain paper. Um, if you um, came to yourself or um, if you're a young, half child or young person, if um, they enjoy tactile input, they might enjoy having lots of different textures. So you could try a low grade sandpaper. So again, I'm just going to draw on my hand on this sandpaper. Now with sandpaper, obviously we're going to go for a low grade. So it gives her a, a kind of um, a light sandpaper. Uh, we don't want anything too coarse because um, we don't want anybody injuring themselves on it. So a nice um, light grade still gives the texture and um, it isn't going to be too harsh on the hands. Um, so this is what I've just chosen this evening is the cardboard, the sandpaper. I've got bubble wrap that I've used. I'll show you now whenever I stand up to show you the wall pushes. So bubble wrap is a really fun way um, of incorporating um, a nice kind of motivating texture into the wall presses. So you can imagine yourself um, just sort of leaning against um, bubble wrap uh, tape to the wall or glue tacked onto the wall and um, really makes it quite motivating and then you get the feedback of popping all those bubbles. So anything that you're buying, if it comes with bubble wrap, any family members who order something with bubble wrap, get them to hold on to it. Okay, so then once we have these cut out, we just use um, whatever is going to be kind to the wall surfaces in your house. So in here I'm using blue tack, you could use tape, whatever, um, there's usually Velcro lying around in a lot of our houses, um, but whatever is not going to strip the paint off your walls, um, if, that's, uh, if that's important. So we just then get the blue tack, and as I say, where you place them on the wall will depend on the person's height. Um, so I have placed these according to my height, and um, obviously a younger child is going to have them much lower down on the wall. Um, just come here. Here, this should, I've got two of the same hands, so it shouldn't really be the way of this, but anyway. Ideally, what you want is for um, most of the hand pencil the wall pushes to be at shoulder level. So when you're standing against the wall or when the child's standing, 
Whenever they put the two hands against the wall, it should be around shoulder height. So they can put their hands on those visual supports and then push in and out from the wall. For an extra stretch, you can place some higher on the wall. And so I've done that, and, and that just gives even more extension the shoulder. Extra bit of stretch. So you can vary the height if you want to use the wall space to do it. You can have several handprints and they work their way along the wall. If you're working within a more limited space where you don't have um, enough room to do a whole length wall like this, you just need one set of handprints and then place their hands on and they can move in and out like that. So you can vary this accordingly. And as I say, you get any textures or colors you want. That's the bubble wrap ones there. So that gives a really nice kind of tactile feedback. Okay, so that is our wall uh, pushes. Very popular in classrooms as well, and um, because it's a nice it's a to, be to, be uh, to go over and do. And um, any of you have heard of sensory pathways as well will be aware that um, these wall pushes are being built into those sensory pathways along uh, corridors in schools uh, to promote that nice regulating seat pressure input. Okay. So what I'm going to show you now, um, moving on to my third activity, um, and this is actually a bonus one that I didn't put um, on the list because it really only came to Aileen and myself today, um, that we thought it would be nice to show you how to make your own weighted lap pad. So I'm sure a lot of you um, are familiar with weighted blankets and weighted items. Um, Weighted blankets and any kind of weighted items, the idea of those is to help um, a, a child, young person, an adult to calm down because it gives that, that deep pressure through the whole body. So as we've already talked about deep pressures associated with um, calming input. So using a weighted item gives that deep pressure input right down through the whole body. Now, just a little word of caution. Um, weighted blankets come in all different weights and sizes. I'll just actually show you this one that I found earlier today. Um, so I can barely lift this one because it's so heavy. So this is a huge, you can see it's an absolutely massive blanket. This would be way too much weight um, for most children. And even I would say, you know, a lot of teenagers would struggle with that kind of weight. So you want to be very careful. And um, if you are buying a weighted blanket, and um, just make sure and um, there are guidelines that the weight of the blanket is appropriate for the weight of the person who's going to be using the blanket. And um, I would also say with weighted blankets, um, just be careful if they are being applied to the upper half of the body, because anybody who has low muscle tones, you know that somebody who maybe sort of finds it hard to sit upright who slouches, if you add weight, that's going to push them down further and then there can be an impact um, on breathing. And um, also, if you're thinking of using it at bedtime, it can be very effective to help people calm down before going off to sleep. Um, but ideally, they shouldn't be sleeping um, under it all night um, just because it can increase body temperature and it can affect breathing. So ideally, either take it away completely um, or move it down to the lower half of the body um, either once the person is in the calm state to go to sleep or is already asleep. But what you can, and the other thing, of course, about weighted blankets is they are expensive. Um, but you can make little weighted items yourself. Weighted lap pads are very popular, so they're much smaller than a weighted blanket and just sits across the person's lap. So it provides that deep pressure input just through the lower half of the body. And uh, for some people, that's enough. And um, that's all the input that they need. So what you can do instead um, of buying one of these weighted lap pads is get um i just used a cushion cover here so i took out uh, the cushion out of it and get some i've got red lentils here um split peas and some marrow fat peas you could use rice and uh, you could use soup mix any kind of heavy dry food like that so what you're going to do then is just fill them your cushion cover and um, with these you could also use a pillowcase and a pillowcase um, so if you're any good at sewing, I'm not, um, but if you are any good at sewing, then you could use a pillowcase, fill it up, and then just sew it um, up in that way. And um, you could, of course, well, you know, bean bags as well, if there's a lot of stuffing in them, it can be quite a nice heavy weight as well. So getting some bean bag filler. But 
It's going to be uh, lentils and split peas all over this room by the time I've finished. So already that's getting quite heavy. I'll put in one more bag here. Um, and as Edie and I were chatting earlier, saying that sort of like particularly those marrow fat peas, because they're larger, they'll give a lovely kind of tactile feedback as well. And um, because I was thinking you could just put the weight in by having the things still in the bag, but um, by putting them loose in here like this, it's going to shape over the knees and it's going to provide lovely kind of tactile feedback and something to fidget with as well. So that's, um, you can see that is not even half full, that's probably about a third full, but that's plenty of weight. And then I've just zipped it up and then that weighted cushion can just go across the person's lap and that gives that deep pressure input that just can be kind of very calming. And um, you're again sort of finding it particularly useful during times maybe where the person is sitting through something that is quite um, overstimulating or quite stressful and um, so maybe thinking of very noisy environments or even just sitting at the dinner table at a busy kind of family meal time and um, that just sitting and having that across the lap can be nice calming input for that. Okay and again if that is something that then you find does work really well and um, you might then want to start going down and looking at different like I've just got a weighted cushion here and you can get little weighted kind of neck cushions, neck pillows, or you might want to go down the road of a weight, a larger weighted blanket. Um, but at least this is a nice, easy way of trying it out first to see if it actually is effective because everybody's sensory preferences, sensory needs are different. Um, and I know a lot of parents would say to me that they come to courses, they think an idea is brilliant and they can't wait to try it with their child. Um, it just doesn't suit that child that they maybe just it doesn't meet their sensory needs so it's always worth trying things out in as simple a way as possible and um, before putting any kind of um large amount of time or money into and um, those kind of resources okay so that's the kind of smaller items um, that i was going to make in this session so what i'm going to do now and i hope it's going to work i'm going to fiddle around with the camera here a bit and um, so you can just bear with me because I want to set up a very simple obstacle course. And um, so I just want to move the camera around and make sure that you can see the floor that I can position in such a way. So fingers crossed, and um, this will work. That should be okay. I'll be explaining it and um, so that's perfect, Jill. That you've got a good view. Okay, great. And um, so obstacle courses. Now, obviously, this is an activity that is more suited to younger children. So this is uh, for those of you who have um, younger children. Um, so an obstacle course, usually what we're asking the child to do, we can mix up the motor activities, um, but usually they're going to be crawling. And crawling um, has so many benefits, particularly again, thinking from the sensory regulation point of view. So when we talk about regulation, that's that calming input. And um, so crawling is very regulating because you're weight bearing through your arms and through your legs. So again, it's that deep pressure input through the muscles and the joints. And that's then a really nice uh, way of getting that input if that's what the person really enjoys and what seems to regulate them. Um, we have other uh, children, young people who enjoy the obstacle courses because they love movement, because they crave lots of movement. So again, thinking back to the stimming and, you know, if you've got a child or a young person who likes to be on the go all the time, then they're going to enjoy uh, the obstacle course from that point of view. Um, also, just thinking a bit broader in OT terms, you know, when we're, um, usually when we're talking about sensory processing in relation to autism, we very much shine a light on sensory regulation. Um, but a big piece of sensory processing is also about the development of motor skills. And again, particularly important in our younger children that we want to develop 
good motor skills so that then that carries over so we want good gross motor skills so then that carries over into their fine motor skills and then fine motor skills are really important for things like holding a pencil fastening a button opening a packet of crisps independently peeling an orange and um, but all of those fine motor skills those really refined fine motor skills come from having good gross motor skills and that's what you get through these obstacle courses as well because you're strengthening the core muscles whenever they're crawling and you're strengthening the shoulder muscles as well and that helps the development of fine motor skills so you can develop a really simple uh, obstacle course at home so i brought in some stuff from my house just to show you so get uh, this was the cushion that the cushion cover was taken off so you can have, um, I'm going to move the table just out of the way so I can make it a little bit more. So you can set this up in your living room, you can use your hallway, and on a day like today, you can go out into the garden if you have space outside. And pack stuff up and take it to the local park, and um, because it's light stuff, it's not uh, too uh, difficult to carry either. And um, so set out some cushions. And uh, or pillows, so I've got a couple of pillows as well. So just set them out in a little path like that. And then uh, what you want is you have two choices here. You can use blankets um, or sheets, whatever. So I've just brought in my duvet cover. Now there's two ways of doing this. You can either just have the blanket for them to crawl under. Or you can create, and um, you'll be uh, tunnels are lovely, really motivating to crawl through. Um, and you can create a tunnel out of the duvet cover. Now, I have to say, I'm not going to do this because this isn't an old duvet cover. I did have a look at home for old duvet covers, but I don't have any. Um, I must have cleared them out in the last few cover. But all you have to do to turn this into a tunnel is just cut along the top seam. And then um, the child can crawl through the open end of the duvet and out through the end that you've cut. So you've created um, a tunnel very simply out of the duvet cover. So then for the obstacle course, the child then simply crawls and they can, you can use it in various ways. So they can crawl over the cushion. So that's kind of makes a nice kind of little textured road and uneven surface. So they fall along the cushion. And then when they get to the end, they turn around and they crawl under the blanket or through the tunnel. Um, you could also, if you have the cushions on a carpeted surface, they could jump along them. So you could vary the gross motor skills. So they could jump along the cushions and then crawl under the blanket. Just don't have them. If you've got um, the cushions on a highly polished floor, like a laminate floor or tiles, don't have them jumping because they're going to slide everywhere. So more on a carpeted floor for that. But jumping, um, that can mix it up a little bit. You could also space the cushions out uh, further apart and have them running in and out of the cushion. So a bit like um, at sports where you would run in and out of cones. Um, going in and out of obstacles like that is a really nice sequencing, organizing activity. Um, so again, from an OT point of view, we're always looking at sequencing, crossing the midline, um, really important motor skill. So going in and out of those um, can help with that as well. And as I said, then crawling, very nice regulating activity, giving that deep pressure through the muscles. Now to make the obstacle course a little bit more interesting and, and a little bit more motivating, what I would usually tend to do is place an activity at the end. So you could have like, if it's a very young child, maybe a little inset puzzle. So at the start, you give them a piece for the puzzle. They jump along the cushions, place it into uh, the jigsaw at the end, crawl through their tunnel, get the next jigsaw piece, jump along, put it into the puzzle. So there is a goal, there's an, a, a purpose to doing the activity, or it might be throwing bean bags at a target when they get to the end, and then they're inclined to come back, get another bean bag, go again. So they'll do the obstacle course enough times that will actually be effective regulation because once probably isn't going to be enough for that. Okay, so that is simple obstacle course. You could, you know, you could use bowls for them to go in and out, like bowl, plastic bowls from your kitchen, saucepans. It doesn't matter what you use, but just kind of creating that little gross motor obstacle course um, at home. And um, just in terms of, we're talking about tunnels as well, and uh, just to show you this lovely tunnel. And um, now this one um, was bought, um, from a company and you can see the length of it hopefully 
and this is made of um, uh, lycra material. So whenever the child or the young person crawls through this tunnel, they're getting, again, going back to that resistant material. So they'll have to really stretch as they crawl through it and they can push against the sides. And that gives a lot of that feedback to the muscles and that proprioceptive input or that deep pressure input that so many of our children and young people really crave. And so I said, this one was bought uh, from a company, uh, but Aileen will be able to tell yourself that she, um, a few years ago, was able to buy material like this, a big bit of uh, stretchy like for material and get one really easily made. So if you're good at sewing or you know somebody who is good at sewing, you just get that like material, sew a seam along um, the side of it and you've created your own tunnel. Um, and it just gives this, making a tunnel out of a duvet cover um, won't give that kind of resistive feedback, whereas using something that's made out of like or will. So if you've got um, somebody that really likes that deep pressure input, that stretching, they're going to love that kind of material. Okay, so um, I'm going to finish off the list of activities I gave you just by very quickly drawing out another obstacle course. Um, I guess a little bit. So the good weather is coming, and um, this is maybe going to be a little bit harder to see, but I can lift the camera um, and show you in a moment. So the good weather coming, we want to get outside more. Um, so what you can do is just use chalk to draw an obstacle course outside. If you have um, a driveway outside your house or a pathway or um, kind of any um, uh, tarmac surface, whatever, outside, then you're going to be able to use that. Um, but I remember seeing um, at the start of lockdown number one last year, um, a lovely example, and I wish I'd actually saved the photo, um, came up on social media, a lovely example where somebody had drawn quite a lengthy obstacle course with chalk on the street. Um, and they were saying that they were really trying to motivate um, their child to go out for a walk. Um, but their child just wasn't really interested in going out for a walk, didn't see the point. But as soon as they then drew an obstacle course where they had to do so many jumps and then they had to run for a bit and then they had to walk and then they had to walk backwards and they just mixed up the activities and it made it much more motivating and really interesting to do. So even going out onto the footpath outside and drawing it there is an option as well. Um, you can be as creative with um, this as you want. Um, but if we think about so what I'm going to do is some lines that um, the child or the young person can jump along. So jumping gives um, that movement input. And um, so we know that a lot of our children, young people, they're stimming is, there, is jumping. So this gives that jumping input and it gives that deep pressure input through the muscles. And then we've got some um, uh, of our children and young people who love to spin. So we can draw a concentric circle on the ground like that. And we might write on it, spin. And then what we can do, and you could vary the colors, I'm just sticking with the same color chalk for um, this. And then we could have a little wavy line, which they have to walk along. This, and then we might finish with some squares just for them. You could do this like a hopscotch sequence for them to jump along. So what we have then, I will uh, demonstrate this so you can watch. So we've got lines drawn on the floor, so they have to jump over each line. Then for the spinning, so that gives movement input to those who really like movement. They could either just stand in the middle of this concentric circle and spin a few times, or they could follow the line and that's going to give that same kind of movement spinning input as they walk the line into the middle. Then, and um, to just kind of calm and focus, having to kind of walk, say, tiptoe along a wavy line like this, and it gives them something to focus on, which is kind of quite calming, and then jump along the squares. So that's just, you know, one kind of very short example. You can make it much longer. The say you build in hopscotch, you could write instructions and um, some uh, for children and young people would like those kind of written instructions of what to do for others it may not make any sense so just having uh, the clear motor actions of what they have to do 
you could model it first or a sibling could model it and they could follow along and then after that modeling um, you could build um, some mindfulness into it as well. So if you are doing it outside and um, you could have them stopping between each step and maybe having you have a picture of a nose, they have to stop and think about what they can smell. Some nice calming grounding activity. They do the next motor step and then they have to stop and there's maybe a picture of an eye and they have to then think about what they can see. So building some calming and um, mindfulness into that as well. And then it becomes a really nice regulating activity. Okay, so um, we're going to give you some bonus activities. It's just checking the time there. Um, I'm going to um, demonstrate the peanut roll because Aideen and I were just talking earlier when we were looking at kind of all the resources that we have here in the center. And we were saying that a lot of the time, maybe people have purchased resources that maybe even recommend different pieces of equipment to buy. But then once they've got them, they're not actually sure how to use them like TheraBand. And that's why I will type in um, later on where you can get that those activities for the TheraBand, because sometimes it's just then coming up with ways of using the equipment. So some of you may have an exercise ball, a gym ball at home, or you may have a peanut roll. So I'm going to show you peanut roll now. Um, so this peanut roll, you can see the difference between a peanut roll and an exercise ball is the peanut roll is basically being squished in the middle, so it's like the shape of a peanut. Why um, that is preferable to the kind of the ordinary exercise ball is it just gives a little bit more support when somebody's lying on their tummy on it, and um, it just slows down the movement a bit and just makes them feel more supported. But having said that, if you have the ordinary round exercise ball, you can do the same activities in that. That's absolutely fine. So um, how we use this then, this is where um, I make a fool of myself. And the main um, activities that we would recommend um, whenever we're using this for sensory regulation is that the child or the young person lies on their tummy and then just pushes through their arms like that. So we'll say it on, maybe get better view. So what they can do then, if they've got the strength through their upper arms, they can lift their feet up off the ground and that's really pushing all the way through the arms then. And some children may feel too unstable, they may not like that, so they can keep their knees and feet on the ground and then they're getting the weight bearing through the arms and through the legs. So it's very much about weight bearing activity. So again, activating the muscles and the joints, giving that deep input that is then very regulating. And um, some will just lie on it and rock backwards and forwards like that on it. Others might like to have some kind of activity in front of them, like a little jigsaw, reading a comic or a book while they're lying over the exercise ball. Um, you can also, um, some just like to sit on it as well. Um, and then we're going to get movement input. So for um, our children, young people, even our adults, who like a lot of movement input, then they can use this for rocking and bouncing on. So it gives that kind of input. And actually it's very nice then, um, if you have one that is of a suitable size or you have a lower table, um, it's a nice thing to sit on for things like homework or at dinner time, where they're being expected to sit, um, but they want that movement input and that'll still give that kind of movement input during those activities. Um, I think that was all that I was going to show you. Aiden can remind me if there was something else I was meant to show you, but I think she's going to come in now and show another couple of pieces of equipment. Um, I'm hoping I haven't forgotten anything, but hopefully that covers it. Um, and hopefully you've been uh, posting in your um, questions there. So what I'm going to do is when that Aiden come in and she's going to show you another uh, couple of pieces of equipment that you may have seen and you're just kind of wondering what they're for or kind of what purpose they serve. So I'll let her come in and do that now. So you've got a couple of minutes break and Aiden will show you that and then we'll finish up.
you for when I'm back, still covered in corn flour. Um, I'm going to share with you um, this Lycra body sock. So Jill has just described Lycra and how it gives us that nice resistance. Um, it provides us with proprioceptive input, um, which we know has a very calming impact um, and very grounding impact. So the body sock, um, again, this can be purchased from um, Amazon, you could buy a piece of lycra material and make your own. Thinking toys also have a range of sizes and colors. They don't tend to come in different types of um, different options for uh, stronger resistance or anything. But basically, um, you just get in. Like so. And bring up the body sock right up to your shoulders. Some of them also have an opening here where you can, it's probably easier to get into than this. And then pushing against it using your arms, legs, and um, knees, shoulders. Um, and again, you could do a very simple obstacle course in this. Um, star jumps. Um, and what would be very helpful would be to have um, some visual supports, maybe even um, you could create the visual supports with your child or young person where they um, carry out the movements, maybe it's animal walks in this, you take a photograph of them doing that so that you could create like a visual sequence of activities that they complete with the body sock. So again, you're not just given the body sock and um, you know, asking them to create ideas themselves. If they have the visual supports of what they actually need to carry out, and um, so it's a scheduled task, um, that might be more helpful to, to add a little bit more structure. The other item I'm going to um, show you is Therapotty. So Therapotty, again, all of these types of items are available from Amazon or Thinking Toys. Um, and again, if you just even Google it, you might find a, a local supplier that um, provides it. Therapotty does come in a range on, of uh, gradients. So this yellow color is very soft. So again, maybe um, it could be used as a fidget toy. You can have a small piece of it for a secondary school pupil underneath the desk, um, or they can carry it around in their pocket. Um, and they can just fiddle with it. Or again, you might want to have a range of photographs or visual sequence of activities that you, that you do complete with it. Um, now, there are some, if you just even Google Therapotty activity ideas, you'll get little visual supports from Google Images, um, or you might want to create your own. So your um, teenager or your child might want to um, model them, you take the photograph and then that's the, um, the sequence of activities that they complete. So creating a circle and getting them to stretch their hands out. Again, we're providing tactile and proprioceptive input here, which has a very grinding, calming effect. Um, it might be even just rolling it up and pinching. So for a younger child, it might be creating like a snake or a dinosaur. Um, so you're pinching and that's providing resistance. Um, you might take a piece off and roll it up within one hand. And again, some of the lovely activities that Jill shared earlier really help to develop fine motor skills. And this is another that will really help to develop fine motor skills. Um, another one is just between the, um, your index finger and your thumb, similar to the whole hand movement earlier stretching it out. So that's a little bit harder when you're just using two digits, stretching it out. And maybe it's doing that maybe five times. Um, some of our uh, referrals to Middletown often like to keep therapotty in their CAM area or CAM space as um, again, you're, you're getting your uh, small scale, fine motor proprioceptive input in that space. So that concludes all of our ideas um, this afternoon, or sorry, this evening, tonight. Um, I'm just going to check, Jill, is there any, if you want to maybe ask any questions, we could have a two-way discussion if there are any more questions. Just 
um, wrap up by um, thanking both of you. Those were some really inventive um, ways of serving sensory needs in the uh, in, in autistic people of well of any age to be honest. But um, uh, so I'll basically think I'll just wrap up by saying um, again thank you to our speakers and to anyone who's watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, found this uh, informative consider sharing the video when it comes out on YouTube uh, alongside the hashtag um, autism month say yes or consider donating at asiam.ie and for the remainder of the next week we will have um, three further webinars and we've got some really exciting things coming up in the pipeline so please stay tuned.